everybody uh, to this uh, very special occasion. We're delighted to uh, having you join us this evening for, for this uh, series, in fact, the first of a series of three uh, events, which has been organized by Tanya Farrelly. She's the Arts Council NUI Galway writer in residence. Uh, it's been great having her here, and um, she's put together this series of events. We're going to be beginning with a discussion of experimental fiction tonight. Uh, but we'll also be having an event, uh, we'll follow up with an event on, on, on the Irish short story, which is taking place on December 1st, and then finally a concluding event on December 8th on creative nonfiction. Very much looking forward to those events. Uh, my name is Daniel Carey. I'm director of the Moore Institute at NUI Galway, and uh, we're really just working in partnership with colleagues uh, in English, in particular John Kenny and Mike McCormick, um, and indeed with Tanya herself, uh, to facilitate the series and really to explore issues with leading writers and to deepen our relationship to some of the, some of the writing practices and, and possibilities that they've been exploring so memorably in their recent work. Uh, so it's really remains for me to hand over to, to Tanya, as I say, looking forward to the discussion and uh, we'll take it from there, Tanya. Thank you very much, Dan, and thanks to the colleagues also at NUIG, as you mentioned, John Kenny and Mike McCormick uh, who are involved in this series as well. So I'm delighted uh, to welcome you all to the first event in the series. As Dan said, we're going to be exploring experimental fiction this evening. And I'm delighted to be joined by two wonderful practitioners, uh, Rob Doyle and Claire Louise Bennett this evening. So Rob is the author of the story collection, This is the Ritual, and the novels Here are the Young Men, uh, which was recently made into a film, and Threshold, which was shortlisted for the Kerry Group Irish Novel of the Year in 2021. Um, and his new book is Autobibliography, which was just launched last week. Um, I'm also joined by Claire Louise Bennett. And Claire Louise's debut book was Pond, which was published by the Stinging Fly Press and was shortlisted for the Dylan Thomas Prize in 2016. And her latest novel is Checkout 19, which was published by Jonathan Cape. So Rob and Claire Louise, thank you so much for joining me this evening. I'm looking forward forward to the discussion. Thanks. So yeah, thanks a lot guys. So guys, as we advertised, the event is uh, focused mostly on experimental fiction. As I mentioned, you're two practitioners of this form. And I'd like to just start off by asking you, Rob, because you edited this book, The Other Irish Tradition, hopefully everybody can see that there, for Dawkey Archive in 2018. Um, and it's an anthology of experimental prose. Um, so I, I'm going to quote you, Rob. <laughs> it's probably a scary thing when you get your own words thrown <laughs> back at you in an interview, uh, especially at the very start. But in, in the introduction um, to the other Irish tradition, you discuss the speed at which things change um, and the fact that art can become irrelevant very, very quickly. Um, and, and to quote you, you said, every realism describes a vanished reality and that art doesn't evolve, but reproduces forms of the past. And, and this type of art is inadequate in the times that we live in today. Um, so in, in your view, Rob, do you think that this is one of the most important aspects then of experimental fiction, um, that it's not simply reproducing past forms all the time and, and becoming irrelevant. Um, thanks, Tanya. Uh, well, first of all, that, that was a bit, uh, it's a bit scary about to hear myself quoted because I couldn't remember for the life of me what I wrote back in the, um, in the introduction to that anthology. Yeah. And uh, as, but I, almost to kind of affirm and confirm what you read back at me there, I kind of feel, things do change and things do move on. And I don't even necessarily think in the same way that I did there when I wrote that anymore. I think um, I th here's, here's one way of looking at it, okay? When you sit down to write, now whether it's fiction or, or, or nonfiction, like my, my own latest one or whatever it is, or some blend of the two, um, which Claire Louise's stuff is, is I, well, to me, it looks like some blend of the two, but uh, whatever you're sitting down to write, I think if you sit down with the self-conscious intention of um, 
moving the tradition forward uh, or something like that, it's just not going to go well. You know, you're going you're gonna to sprain your ankle, I, I think. Uh, it's just, it's not, it, I don't think it really works like that. You, you know, your, your, your connectivity, your connection to inspiration and so on. Like Susan Sontag has, um, I'm really going to throw a spanner in the works with this quote now, but Susan Sontag has a line where she says, um, the very notion of experimental writing or experimental art is suspect, at, at best suspect, at worst, maybe Philistine and vulgar, because it assumes that there's a choice. Uh, and according to her, there is no choice. Either one is original or one is not. And so, um, and I think if, if memory serves me right, I think I did get to this point in the introduction to that anthology, which is that the great, the truly great authors who, um, who I find endlessly rich and endlessly kind of uh, compelling, who, who broke down borders and who did something new, I think it would be so like Borges, the great Argentine, or, or Roberto Bolaño, or people like that. Mm -hmm. It would almost be reductive and limiting and a bit misleading, I think, to label them as experimental authors, because what they manage to do and why they're so utterly novel and fresh and compelling is on the page, they somehow manage to become completely themselves. Um, in other words, they didn't like I say, self-consciously try to renew some tradition or something like that, but they just ruthlessly and relentlessly went after their own impulses, their own desires, their own urges. Um, they had, as J.G. Ballard said, the, the courage of their own perversities. And my own writing, I like to think, has been driven by the same urge you know with each book i kind of feel i mean i'm i'm insanely proud of all of them but i do feel that there's a kind of internal progress going on with each that i'm kind of getting closer and closer to being absolutely unimpededly myself as a as a writer and of course the paradox of this is that to become oneself as a writer one has to um really really drink deep from the other writers, the, 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 the inspirations, the mentors, as it were, you know, the, uh, the masters, the, the, whoever it is that you, that you can learn from. Yeah, yeah, terrific. Yeah, and I was going to bring up Borges, actually, because, of course, you, you mentioned him as, as I think you say he's one of the most mm -hmm. or the most important writer, you feel, um, of his time. I do. I say that of a century. Yeah, that was yeah. my kind of uh, grandiose claim, but I, I, that's how I feel about him. Yeah. It's a bit of a, yeah. a long-lasting love affair, that one. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and I know Mike McCormick would agree with you there. He's, he's a big fan of Borges as well. Sure. Um, so, yeah, so is it really about finding new ways of saying things, finding new new forms of expression then? Um, I know also in that introduction, Rob, if I remember correctly, you, you talked about the fact that the great writers, they don't set out to be experimental, and we touched on that there already, um, that, that it just so happens that way. They, they, they just say something in the best way they possibly can. Um, of course, now we're, we're sticking a label on these people and calling them experimental writers because it's, it's not kind of the straightforward traditional narrative that, that we're so used to. Um, so yeah, I guess it, it is about just finding new ways to say something so that it stays current, I guess. Yeah, and actually, um, the man who um, asked me to edit that anthology, John O'Brien, um, uh, the, the, the great John O'Brien, the founder of the Doki Archive Press, who sadly passed away last year, um, I, I think it might have been him, or maybe it was one of his uh, writers he loved, uh, Gilbert Sorrentino, or somebody like that, who said um, that the, the, another reason that the word experimental writing is a bit tricky and a bit uh, problematic, to use a word I, I never really use, uh, is that it suggests that the work itself is somehow provisional. It's somehow contingent. It's incomplete. You know, uh, like, I don't want anyone to read my books and think, oh, well, that was a 
and experiment. I want them to read it and think yeah. that was that was the thing. That was it. That was the um, the experiment didn't go wrong. You know, the Bunsen burner didn't blow up in your hands and mm. leave, leave your, your your fingers blown off. So uh, yeah, just to complicate it a bit, I, I would throw that in. Yeah, yeah, terrific. Thanks a lot, Robert. And all of that makes perfect sense. But you know, you're you're not saying experimental writing is something gimmicky or you know facetious or whatever. Yeah. Um, so Claire Louise, uh, just just to move move over to you on that. Um, I, I know you've cited Anna Quinn as as one of your influences. Um, and you said in a previous interview that I read uh, that Anna Quinn's work doesn't feel like experimentation. Um, you said it feels like she's she's trying to show what it's like to be alive at a particular time um, and, and what that feels like. Um, is that what you wanted to achieve when you wrote Checkout 19? Can you tell us a little bit maybe about the genesis of that novel? Okay, yeah, I guess it's, um, yeah, like, like Bob has already um, mentioned that you, you don't really set out to, to write um, an experimental novel and um, the, the term does have certain connotations that mm, make it seem uh, like it's something slightly sort of haphazard or um, like you, you don't really know what you're doing in a way. Um, then on the other hand, an experiment is also something that is testing what's already there, certain principles, certain laws with the intention of discovering uh, further possibilities um, and opening things up. So that's a connotation that I guess I would uh, try and, and fix on more because I, I generally don't really like the term experimental. Um, and it's a term uh, that comes from the, ex you know, the exterior, um, academia, critics, and so on, who over however many decades have established a kind of an orthodoxy in terms of what a novel is and what it and what it does. Um, and there's always this sense that the novel has to sort of do something um, in ways that other art forms don't necessarily have that, that pressure to sort of do and, and fulfill. Um, I've been reading some quite interesting essays actually by Fannery O'Connor on, on the subject and she, she makes the point that um, out of all the various artists, fiction writers are sort of the ones most deviled by the public because we're dealing with life and everyone knows something or other about life, <laughs> you know? Um, so everyone feels like they know how it should be done, you know? And they have uh, expectations about what should be there. Um, so she, and she makes a great point about the, uh, the minister wants to see a sermon and the, the politician wants to see a, a kind of a, a you know, set of intentions. The poor want to see the rich, the rich wants to see justification for themselves, you know. Um, so there's, a, there's all these expectations that, that are there. Um, and, So more than any, yeah. So more than any other art form, I guess you're you're kind of you're kind of hemmed in a bit, or, or you could potentially be hemmed in, or you've got quite a lot of things kind of you're aware of and conscious of as as a writer that you shouldn't shouldn't should not be doing. Um, and in terms of my own reading, my own expectations, then where where I came from as a, as a reader and as Checkout Nineteen sort of attests to, um, is that gradually I found myself orienting more towards misfits really uh, uh books by people kind of i guess on the on the edge of things of it um outsiders and so on like gene reese and paul bells and those those kinds of people um because particularly being from england um the, the, the english novel would be well a form of in some ways kind of a soft nationalism in the sense that it, it puts forward a very kind of a uh, I suppose unexamined idea of what an English person's life should revolve around and consist of. Um, and that would be things like marriage and parenting and career and, 
and things that just don't come automatically to a lot of people like mm-hmm. myself those just weren't things uh that I that I found myself uh pursuing I didn't feel that those things would give my life meaning particularly so I began to orientate towards uh writers that were um producing books or had produced books that set out a different way of being in the world um and by their nature then they are going to um express that um in a, in a different form right the narrative form isn't isn't really going to be um the, the best way of of dealing with their own uh their own outlook and their own way of being in the world you know because it's mm-hmm. the narrative form is is, is is linear it's well made it's all those things so it's just not fit for your own purpose that, that's interesting claire louise because having read check of 19 recently it, it makes sense to me what you're saying there because you know you, you have a, a character who is revisiting um a lot of maybe seminal moments in her life um on, on her path to becoming the person who she is now and and your type of narrative is probably closer to our to all of our realities you know that it, it's not just linear it does go back and forward and it flows and and certainly that's um you know that's that's revealed in your writing style as well you know there's it's much more fluid there's much more of a flow to it you know we we visit certain passages in the book and then we revisit them again a little bit later but as you say it's not linear it's not just going from beginning to end Mm -hmm. and I'd say that probably you know is, is more of a true reflection of our own lives yeah Okay. Um, it, it struck me as well, guys, um, you know, when I was reading your work and, and reading around your work that, you know, it, it struck me that even when I organized this event, I, I probably haven't realized the extent to, to which you were so well paired. Um, and, you know, there's similarities between Checkout 19 and your novel Threshold, um, Rob. Um, so, I mean, they both follow protagonists who are, as I said to Claire Louise, living through these seminal moments. Um, you know, both characters are to a degree introspective. Uh, they, they share a love of philosophy and literature and they, you know, they, they talk about books. And so they actually have a lot in common. Um, be interesting to, to see what would happen if, if those two characters met, actually. Um, so, so Rob, when you wrote Threshold, um, which, which was called autofiction, um, and, and I wonder what you think about that, that term as well, uh, you know, talking about labels like experimental and, you know, this is all down to marketing, isn't it, where, where booksellers want to know where, where these things belong on the shelves and how they're going to promote them. Um, and I thought it was quite interesting, this, this term of autofiction. Um, and, and what sort of um, response do you have it being, being labelled autofiction? Is it autofiction? Um, and and is, is that something that, you know, you maybe have a, a mischievous sense of, of enjoyment from that about the reader maybe wondering what's true and what isn't <laughs> when they read Threshold? Yeah, there's a lot of mischievous enjoyment of a lot of things in that book, maybe in, in my books in general, uh, mischievous enjoyment is the kind of uh, the, the, the baseline of, of what's going on for, for the writer and hopefully for the reader too. Um, you probably won't be surprised to hear that I find also the term autofiction a little bit, um, you know, I'm not entirely comfortable with it or I don't entirely yeah. kind of identify with it. Mm -hmm. But I've kind of, in another way, I've kind of resigned myself to it. And I even hear myself using it from time to time, which I never used to do. You know, I I used to kind of tell, I remember thinking that the French had this back in the 70s. You know, when it was, when the term was coined, I can't remember which French um, author first used it. But um, Claire Louise probably knows. But um, uh, 
so yeah and then suddenly people were talking about it as if it's this thing that got invented by i don't know ben lerner or sheila hetty four or five years ago or something but it, so I, I think there is an extent to which it is just a marketing term and a label more or less useful um like so many labels um but more or less distracting or something too because again what it comes down to for me is that when I wrote Threshold, which I put a few years into, you know, that, that book was a bit of an odyssey in lots of ways. I certainly didn't sit down to write autofiction. I just sat down to write in the way that I could and I wanted to write that particular book. Um, I, I, I finished um, my first novel here at a young man back in, I put, it was published in 2014, but I, you know, I'd been writing it for a few years before then. But already by that point, it, by the time it was published, I'd really moved on. And some of the stories in um, This is the Ritual, my second book, a collection, were really already pointing towards this voice that I felt like I'd been groping towards for quite some time, which was very first person, very kind of yeah. moving in and out of different registers, the essayistic, the comical, the slapstick, the, the deadly serious, the philosophical, all of that. Um, the, there was a story in that book called On Nietzsche, which I was particularly proud of. It's probably still my favorite one in there. And it was kind of somewhere between a madcap personal breakdown uh, short story in the first person and half a kind of literary essay, um, a philosophical essay. And I kind of felt like I had cracked the code I'd been trying to crack for quite a while when I hit on that voice. And I kind of knew that the next book I wanted to write, which turned out to be Threshold, would really go deeper and further into exploring the possibilities, the freedoms of that voice. I think all of these labels kind of come and go and they're useful to a degree, but basically whenever I write a book, what I'm always trying to go get at is, is freedom, is more and more freedom, you know? And, um, and that first person voice that again, you know, it was it, where, whereby it's clear to the reader that most of this stuff or even all of it probably happened, but there's also the kind of uh, pact made with the reader, which, which, which kind of suggests that maybe some of it didn't happen. Uh, that was, I just knew that that was the voice I wanted to explore. And it really was freeing because it allowed me to talk about whatever the hell I wanted. You know, there's that great line from Milan Kundera, which I, um, I've quoted actually in Autobibliography, the new one, where he's talking about the history of the novel in his great little book. Um, uh, what is it called again? The Art of the Novel. And uh, he says um, that every true novelist you know, every, every true novelist who's seriously concerned with the art form should, with each book, should forge a means of writing whereby they're not obligated to stray for even a sentence, he says, from that which fascinates them. And, uh, you know, the, the thing about um, when you get into uh, elaborating plots and that kind of thing, you know, I've done a certain amount of that, particularly with my first book, and, you know, there's a real, there's an art to it and, and it can be great and some readers love it and so on, but I'm not that interested in it for the, for the most part, or at least not in my own writing, because the, the thing about that particular classical novel structure is that almost invariably it means you are going to have to stray from that which fascinates you, if only so that, you know, you can put the Subutio, Subutio players kind of flicked into place for the next scene the next set piece the next drama to unfurl and so i'm always trying to um find a book find a way of writing a book each book which is 100 percent uh what i want to be saying what i want to say and zero percent filler or, or or scaffolding or furniture or whatever we want to call it and uh yeah so for, the threshold then became about all the places I'd lived, you know, experiences I've had. It became about books I've read, ideas that shocked me or fascinated me or uh, compelled me about drug experiences, about sexual experiences, basically about life, you know, 
Um, the, kind of the way actually Claire Louise was talking about, you know, this kind of reaction against the, the, the classical form of the English novel, how it basically uses a certain form of, 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 of life that isn't actually for everybody and kind of doesn't really examine it. I was kind of doing my own um, tormented 30 something male version of finding that same kind of um, alternative route, you know, to be able to dig a tunnel in writing um that was custom fit you know that, mm. that 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 shaped itself around me terrific yeah thanks rob and and i, I can totally see what you're saying to, to write about things that fascinate you i mean what better thing can you do as a writer you know um and that comes across in the writing as well that, you know these are these are topics that that fascinate the writer and and that translates to the reader i think as well hopefully you know that they find it equally as as interesting um and and claire louise um on, on that note um on the blurb of checkout 19 um it says fusing fantasy with lived experience checkout 19 is a vivid and mesmerizing journey to the small traumas and triumphs that define us as readers, as writers, and as human beings. So similarly to, to what I asked Rob there about autofiction, um, were you comfortable, I suppose, with that description of, of this book using fantasy with lived experience? Well, I <laughs> I always kind of very quickly read, you know, the, the blurb thing and mm. never look at it again. That was interesting okay. to hear. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sounds great, you know. Because it's great. just like, well, you know, they, they've got to kind of try and, and put something, some shape on it, give the reader <laughs> yeah. something, I suppose. <laughs> and you kind of listen to it and you go, yeah. But no, and in, in uh, seriousness, I, I am actually um, very interested in the relationship <laughs> between reality and, and fantasy. And I remember coming uh, across something in a, a, an essay a few years ago by a psychologist and um I guess she was a was she Freudian or no I don't know anyway she said that we're we are born into fantasy and that we only gradually acquire a sense of reality which makes complete sense we kind of we kind of know that right we start getting the, the building blocks together and the different values and all the rest of it that then make us able to sort of live in uh, the society, the very specific society that we live in. We could have lived in, in, in any number. We could have popped out and, and thrown into the, into the world in any number of different scenarios and places. So yeah, the reality that, that we are in is something that we, that we acquire, obviously. And, and parenting is about um, helping, helping that integration to, to happen. It must be so difficult, really. Um, so, I am, I am very interested in, uh, I guess, the relationship between those two things um, and the way that um, the idea of fantasy is something that's sort of um, seen as something a bit, I don't know, silly or, or frivolous or, you know, kind of out, out there. It, it's separate as, as nothing that really has any bearing particularly uh, uh, on one's day to day. Um, but I, I don't think that's, that's true at all. Um, and I suppose that's another another interesting thing that exper you know experimental forms, art forms, whether in literature or art, um, have been sort of addressing is 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 trying to bring in those elements of our of our lives and of our um, personhoods. Uh, is is those more I guess irrational aspects? You know, dream like the surrealists were working with dreams and the unconscious and all those kinds of things. Um, which are very very strong you know i think they're very very strong forces in our in our lives um that doesn't mean that you're not um a realist and you're not working within the back you know within a, a realist but your sense of what realism is is always dependent upon what your 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 reaches of reality is the scale of your existence if you like you know and if your reality is very much you know a rational kind of construct following kind of social patterns and you know then you're going to write a pretty solid sort of conventional novel but you're at a sense of reality and what it can be composed of and 
it goes beyond, you know, beyond that, then those, those aspects are also going to be present in whatever you write. And that's going to feel very natural to you. You know, it's not going to feel particularly zany or peculiar. We're just, yeah. we're just trying to uh, testify to something that, that is part of your overall outlook and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, ab absolutely. And and something I've been thinking a lot about lately is is truth and fiction. Um, I teach a lot of creative writing classes and I, I generally tell students, you know, that most of the great stories, there's going to be some grain of truth in them. So I, I would argue that, you know, there's there's truth in a lot of, of the great stories that we read. You just don't have the writer putting their hand up and saying, well, actually, yes, this happened, you know, uh, because as writers, of course, we all bring our own lived experiences and, and and those of others that we've heard about and found interesting we bring all of that to our writing um it, it's just by by putting labels such as auto fiction or something like that that turns it into something else isn't it you know um where i think everybody is, is doing it to some degree whether they're writing straightforward narratives or, or whether it is seen as something more experimental and mm -hmm. um, that those truths are, are in there um woven in with that fiction and I think that's what makes great stories um so I actually meant to say at the beginning just for our audience members we have a Q&A down at the bottom of your screen so if anybody does want to ask a question rather than putting it in the chat box if you can put it in the Q&A and I'll be taking a look at those a little bit later on um, and Claire Louise, could I ask you at this point maybe to give us um, an excerpt from Checkout 19? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Terrific. Yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Well, I'm gonna read it um, from my screen, but I think that's gonna work out okay. Because yeah, as I said, right. I'm in a hotel and I didn't. I forgot to bring. Yeah, no, that's gonna be fine. It's a bit weird then because I can't see. That doesn't matter. I don't guess. It's even Anyways. better actually because you're looking directly at your audience. Then I am. Am I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so this is from. I haven't read this bit before. Just to say, actually, before I start. I start this. Um, I have been reading Rob's um, new, new book, Auto Bibliography, mm. and you're and you're right. I mean, I haven't read Threshold yet, so I I don't know about the parallels there, but um, certainly with this, I've just found it amazing to read. There's so there are so many um, so many things I've underlined and, and recognised, and in terms of um, obviously with as with my own book, it's it's uh, about. Um, Bob's relationship to books and discovery of, of yeah. books and and also from the perspective of a working class uh, person and mm. um just, just I, yeah just the impact I suppose that that, that that literature and the romantic ideas that you you, you bring and um to, to literature and, the, and your I've just found it anyway I just found it really it's just so much that I've I've um thank you I've underlined that. and I've really enjoyed it it's been really really good that's lovely so anyway um so this is chapter three. Won't you? It's called "Won't You Bring in the Birds," um, and each chapter begins with a kind of a quote from the book. And this is from the um, Ario Patitica by John Milton. And the quote goes: "For books are not absolutely dead things, but do contain a potency of life in them, to be as active as that soul was whose progeny they are. Nay, they do preserve, as in a vial, the purest." efficacy and extraction of that living intellect that bred them. So I, I say that because Rob might like that. I, think I like that one. So when I was in my early 20s, I began to write a story about a man named Tarquin Superbus. Tarquin Superbus was a very elegant sort of man who lived in a very elegant European city sometime in a previous century. I didn't mention in the story which century the unfolding events described took place in. I simply wrote long ago at the beginning of the tale and left it at that because I wasn't really sure myself when exactly or where exactly the story happened. In fact, my sense of when and where swung back and forth from one century to another, from one European country to the next. Sometimes, as I wrote, it seemed that my portrayal of this character, Tarquin Superbus, and the apartment and the city where he lived was very much in tune with the 1800s. At other times, it seemed to me that the vibe of what I was writing exemplified the mores of a much earlier time, somewhere around the beginning of the long Renaissance. Setting this 
particular story around the time when Europe was on the cusp of modernity made sense thematically. But whenever Tarquin Superbus opened his mouth and had conversations with the doctor, for example, neither of them spoke in the manner of that era. Their way of speaking was much more in line with the way I imagine gentlemen in the mid 1800s to speak, Byzantine, comical and portending. In addition to speech, there was also the matter of Tarquin Superbus's attire and apartment to consider. The image I had of him fluctuated. Sometimes he appeared to me as a trumped up figure from Commedia dell'arte. The next minute he is looking spry in a perky tricorn. Other times he is closeted by an elaborate puffy ruff. Sometimes he sported pearly white hose. Lo and behold, here he comes, light on his feet in outlandish, cross gartered stockings a la Malvolio. He often wielded a swinging cane with a silver top, and sometimes that silver top was in the shape of a Goya-esque owlet with hungry outstretched wings, and other times it was the dour tapered mask of Il Dottore, and other times still a plucky vole. Yet regardless of what sartorial flourish bedecked his attire, Superbus was nearly always swathed in a cape or a cloak mostly a cloak that swelled and swung behind him as he strode past dim lanterns, one after the next, down this or that dark passageway. Sometimes it seemed there might well be a dagger or some such dastardly device tucked deep within its dark folds. Various accessories occurred to me on and on, popping up one after the next, as if from out a magician's hat, and it vexed me that the marvellous mishmash of blad rags and clandestine accoutrements that came to mind whenever I thought about Tarquin Superbus would ultimately undermine the credibility of my story if I set them all down, but set them down I did all the same anachronism upon anachronism, because it was immensely enjoyable for one thing, and historical incongruence notwithstanding, it seemed to me that such details lent the tale so much atmosphere and intrigue. Long ago, Long, long ago. Indeed, isn't that when all fairy tales occur long ago, no one quite knows when. As far as his apartment was concerned, the image that most came to mind was that of an aubergine. I've always been very taken with aubergines, with the way they are so tightly sheathed in a shining bulletproof darkness. When I was a dismayed student in London, I often fantasized about hanging a great many aubergines from the square ceiling of my sketchy boudoir. Imagine lying there beneath such a pendulous sandalier of lambent bloom. Imagine the transporting reflections slipping across their sleek hermetic skins, the assuaging shadows they cast as degradation tipped them into slow stately revolutions, the whisperings, the whisperings, the sighs, the melancholy glow. I lay there and imagined it often, but couldn't realize my dream of course. Aubergines were expensive and I would have needed at least 90 of them. I'd had some rather fanciful ideas about what studying literature at university would entail. The sorts of mellow rooms I'd passed through, the views I'd come upon, the crepuscular light, the animated hush, the slinking patina and reoccurring fleur de lis, the bicycles and small bridges, everything on the turn, and most of all, the sharp and charming people I'd meet. In fact, as it turned out, a great many of them liked nothing better than to sit in the middle of their beds in the middle of the day, watching Australian soaps cross-legged with the door wide open. Do you want a cup of tea? They would sometimes ask when occasionally I leant up against the door frame and scowled within. No, I would invariably reply, and thereupon carry on down the corridor with the intention of having a very long hot bath once I got to the end of it. The communal bathroom in halls was basic, austere and cold. The mirrors were frameless and thin, the tiles white and the grouting between them black and crumbling like boneyard soil, and the stark taps obdurate and shrill. The water that twisted out of them, however, was clear and soundless as fresh blown glass. There were showers, of course, but I almost never used them because communal showers almost always reminded me of the death camps. So I preferred to take a bath and there were two baths, I think, but there may have only been one. Certainly there was one in a small room with a sloping ceiling. That's right. And off kilter and an off kilter wooden chair beside it. It was a very deep enamel bath, somewhat discolored. And the water that billowed from the hot tap was scalding. 
the bathtub was where I felt private and absolutely away from everyone and everything and perhaps I'd pretend some things while I was in it perhaps I pretended I was in an asylum at last with nothing much to do and no expectations upon me or perhaps I imagined I was in a maid in a big house doing her ablutions on a dismal Sunday evening before a rapid and somewhat violent resignation with Sir halfway up the further nose stairwell. In my own quarters, I quite often threw furniture and smashed things. Someone I've known since then maintains time and again that I once flicked the te- chest of drawers across the room with just two fingers. Don't exaggerate, I always say. Two, he always says back, holding two fingers up in the air meaningfully. Is he swearing the truth or showing me what two fingers look like? I drank a lot of Lapsong Shushong then and would leave unfinished mugs of it here and there, which meant that when a piece of furniture plunged vertical, several mugs went right along with it, flinging these perfectly round velvety tapestries of mould up ahead until they flapped and landed like creepy little doilies all along this fluffy bookcase. And I drew on the walls, nothing sinister, waves mostly, with a nub of blue hue chalk I'd slipped off the pool table into my pocket with the king's head one evening. The walls of Tarquin Superboss's apartment were without a doubt the colour of aubergines, and so were the long heavy drapes, and so too was the wooden floor. There were white things here and there, and those white things seemed to float, gloves becoming doves, becoming skulls, suspended as they were in this shining sea of darkness. There we go. Thank you so much, Claire Louise. That was fantastic and so beautifully read as well. I think you should consider narrating your own work. That was just absolutely gorgeous. Um, the the imagery is it's so very vivid, and you, you took us in and out of so many of the protagonist's thoughts there. Um, I thought it was quite interesting when I was reading Checkout 19 that we had this other story, like a story within a story going on with this character of Tarquin Superbus. Uh, fantastic name, Claire Louise. Where did you come up with that? It's funny because I didn't, I wasn't sure. And then of course, now in the time since, as I said, that was a story I, I did write many, many years ago. Um, and it's strange because I don't really write that kind of thing at all. Yeah. Um, uh, and it was it was kind of peculiar then because I I thought, well, I'm going to write about, it seemed fitting to, to, to revisit that and write about how I'd written a story that, mm. that was then destroyed and I, I could never kind of pick up again or, or recreate. And I thought that it was, uh, my recollection of it um, was only going to be maybe a a paragraph or two. And then it ended up, um, God, being a a pretty big chunk of of Checkout 19. Um, And it's it's kind of like Rob says, and I remember coming across that Millen Kundera piece in um, Testaments Betrayed like years ago when, if you, if, you, if you find yourself still writing and there's an urgency there and it matters, then just keep doing it. So more stuff just kind of came to me. Um, and, you'll, and you'll notice anyway, as the, as the kind of the recollection of Tarquin and it kind of comes to light. But um, as the story kind of takes off again, it, it's very inconsistent because I'm changing my mind all the way kind of through. And, the, the character of the, the doctor then is, is, is wildly inconsistent. And in the end, you know, I kind of end up sort of fancying him. It's a bit strange. At the beginning, he starts off like a vampire and he's like 300 years old. And it's interesting yeah. for me because I don't really deal with characters, with characters very often at all, like just inventions. So I did find it very interesting to see how I how I felt about them. And then I found myself getting kind of like amorously kind of involved with one of them, you know. And then that, I was like, well, <laughs> that's kind of on the on the page. In the end, he's wearing this Italian suit or something and he smells nice, you know, yeah. and the maid is flirting with him. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> it's, 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 great. So, it's great. And so then rather than going back and changing it all so that he was like that from the beginning, you know, mm. I thought, well, I'm going to leave that in to kind of show yeah. how, how you're feeling toward a character kind of might change if you're just spending more, I guess, more time with them or something like that. And as I said, that's just not something that I, mm. that I do very often. Um, but to answer your question about, about the name, I was like, that's such a weird name. And I Googled it and actually it is the name of, I think one of the last Roman emperors 
oh right <laughs> I was like I have no idea I mean I must have I must have known that or I must have I don't know how I don't know where I would have come across that yeah well, I must have come across it somewhere maybe it when was, I was in doing there in the A levels or something yeah 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 <laughs> but I didn't um and I don't mention that in in the novel but um yeah yeah everything resurfaces somewhere doesn't that's it, say, you know, isn't it you know yeah. that is it and I couldn't believe it because I thought super bus that's weird but I thought I bet it's one of those strange names that kind that does exist you know so I put mm. it in and sure enough not only does it exist it ex existed like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago yeah so crazy yeah. But those inconsistencies of character that you're talking about there, Claire Louise, I mean, it, it's it's kind of consistent in some ways because you, you mentioned about, you know, when she's writing about him and she invents him. She she doesn't know when it's set and, yeah, you know, yeah. just as you say, a time long, long ago. Um, and, and that time keeps changing in her mind. And and, and so do his outfits along with the time, which is yeah, yeah. great, you know, describing as, as you read out there, the trumped up figure from the Commedia dell'Arte day and then having him in the tricorn and wielding the cane and, and they're fantastic descriptions of this guy and mm -hmm. and and just oh, you know it's so fluid oh, and, but it really really works you know um so yeah terrific reading it was it was a great a great choice um of, of section to read there claire louise thank thanks so much um mm -hmm. it's just so very vivid you know i love how you you bring the senses in there and you know, you've gorgeous, gorgeous descriptions there, like the crepuscular light. I loved that. Um, or crumbling like boneyard soil. There were there were gorgeous, gorgeous phrases in that passage. Um, and I love that part there towards the end where you read where she's she's in the bath and she's she's uh, pretending maybe that she's she's finally arrived in an asylum, or maybe she's a maid in a big house. It's it's really interesting. To, to get so deep into a character's mind, you know, because you were saying you don't really do character, but actually you really bring us deep into this character's head, you know, and we, we're, we're privy to all these different thoughts that are they're flowing in and out. Really, really interesting. Um, yeah, no, great. Thanks, Sarah Louise. Um, so, Rob, um, I, I'd like to chat to you a little bit about autobibliography now, um, because talking about different different styles, um, you know, we talked about some of your, your earlier books there um, a little while ago, and, you know, you, you had the novel, you had the short story collection, you had the, the auto fiction, as it's been called, um, and, and autobibliography is your first uh, book that, that has nothing to do with fiction apart from obviously talking about it and reviewing it um, so it came about uh, because you were writing about the books that you loved um, for the Irish Times um, and interestingly actually a, a huge percentage of our non-fiction of the books that you've chosen to talk about in it as well but it's, it's quite an interesting form, isn't it, in, in autobibliography? And I know Claire Louise has been reading it, so she, she knows this as well, um, that it wasn't made up just of your reviews, um, which you said you had to keep very short, which I imagine was a very difficult thing to do. Um, and I'm sure you just felt you wanted to say so much more about each book that you've chosen. But it's, it's the sections of autobiography in between and, and your thoughts about various things that are sparked off and connected to the books that you've chosen. Um, that, that makes it a really interesting form. I loved reading the, those, those pieces and those thoughts, you know, that, that were sparked. Um, so, so how did you come up with that, Rob? I mean, you know, you obviously never intended in the first place to, to compile the reviews into a book. How did that idea come about? Well, I did and I didn't, you know, okay. um, but uh, yeah, but before I answer uh, that, uh, Tanya, uh, Claire Louise, that was great, that reading, um, it yeah. struck me several things while I was listening to it, it was, kind of, it's, it, it, it's, I, I haven't yet read uh, Checkout 19, I do own a copy and I will be reading it, I've only heard great things, I did read um, Claire Louise's, I think, justly and widely beloved previous book, Pond, Mm -hmm. uh, but it struck me that it was a fiction about what goes on, the phenomenology, uh, to use a kind of lofty word that I often trip over trying to say, the phenomenology of what happens when we're writing fiction and when we're reading 
um, which just strikes me as almost virgin territory for, for, for writing, for fiction. Um, so it was exhilarating to hear. But um, yeah, Tanya, so autobibliography, I, kind of everything I write, apart from shopping lists, I'm always thinking about a future book somewhere down the line. Even if I don't know what that book is or might be, I'm always thinking about, you know, I'm not one of these um, authors, like maybe somebody like John Banville, who has a very kind of hard dichotomy between the novels, which are sacrosanct, and reviews and criticism and essays and so on. Uh, which are not and which are disposable okay. and so on. I've always kind of thought, well, every time I write, uh, it, it's that Sebald quote again, you know, the, 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 the novel is not my, my tool, prose is my, prose is my tool, the sentence is my tool. And so I always think about a future book of some sort. Um, and when I was writing these columns, this was a couple of years ago, I was living in Berlin at the time and I got this wonderful gig of being able to write um, for, for, for very little money, actually, but it was a real labor of love. Um, uh, I got to write every week about one of my favorite old books. That was the only stipulation, was that they had to be pre-21st century books. Um, and they had to be quite short, about 340 words, because they needed to fit into the newspaper column in the Irish Times. But uh, I had a real, I had a ball while I was writing it, you know, um, it was, it was clear to me from the outset that I was going to use this, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of an exhibitionist, I've, you know, long since realized, and I, I, it was clear to me from the outset that I was going to use this platform, canvas, whatever you want to call it, to write about, not only about books that I loved and writers, but to kind of uh, get into some parts of my own self, my own past, my own present, and so on. And um, so the book, so the columns, the 52 columns always had a kind of autobiographical flavor, even if they were very overtly about these, these books, mm -hmm. these books that I say, as I say in the introduction, formed me, sometimes reformed me, or even deformed me. Um, it's, a, it, it's a list of, as I call it, sometimes quite masochistic pleasures. You know, I'm, I've always been into the kind of readers or the, the writers who will kind of ruin your life a little bit. And so there's a lot of those in here. Um, but I got to the end of it. And so I obviously had these 52 columns. And then at the end of that, or at the start of 2020, I moved back to Ireland and moved back down. I moved down to Rustler Harbour, kind of alone away from the noise of the city and was kind of living on the beach down there, or not on the beach, but living near the beach and was having this very kind of idyllic, solitary time. And I decided that, well, why don't I kind of uh, expand these 52 columns into a book? Um, and again, you know, that thing I was talking about at the beginning with each book wanting to access a new vein of freedom, of, of uh, free possibility. As soon as I hit on the idea of how I would do this one, that sense of freedom just opened up. It was this wonderful, exhilarating feeling. And the idea was basically that I would write a, a split screen book, which is to say that the, uh, the columns, the 52 numbered columns are on one side. Uh, yeah. And then on the next, mirroring each one, you have 52 loosely connected, sometimes very directly connected, mm -hmm. sometimes not mm -hmm. so connected, um, reflections, italicized um, kind of micro essays or not so micro essays or personal reflections. And that, you know, the only thing tying them all together would be that they're all about books, they're about reading, they're about writing, and they're about the life, my own, from which these practices are inseparable and from which these readings are inseparable so hence the the the, the somewhat cheesy title autobibliography you know it's a kind of self-portrait in readings um and oh yeah and then while i was down there the bloody pandemic that happened um you know while i was living i was already in this kind of social isolation that was not such a big um, ordeal for me but this vast global event was going on while I was 
living down there and writing these these columns and so that just kind of filtered into it too you know because I'd, I'd kind of again hit on this form where I felt I could really write every day I would wake up and write another of these 52 reflections and uh, it was a form in which like I say I could write about pretty much whatever I wanted to um, I saw no reason to write my own kind of reflections on the unfolding global historical event as it was happening so um in one sense it's it's this book that's about books and in another you know which sounds almost narrow in a way but then in another sense it's 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 broad and it's about everything and it's about uh, there's a lot of you know confessional writing in it if we want to use that word a lot of stuff about travel a lot about drifting a lot about loneliness about you name it it's in there so um and just about reading you know it's a bit why i'm intrigued to re read um as soon as i get a chance uh, check out 19 it seems to be uh, in many senses like this but it, stylistically different but some of the subject matter seems to be so resonant with it yeah. namely it seems like it's a book if i understand from what i've heard correctly it seems to be a book about the books in a life you know the the, the reading that has formed the consciousness and a psyche and a and a, and a being in the world uh, to use the, the phrase claire louise used um so that's it yeah. Yeah. terrific so so rob i believe you're going to read a couple of those extracts for us yeah yeah. yeah yeah i thought what i would do tanya is i will read um now I said it was the split screen, so I'm going to read the, the yeah. reflections. I'm going to read two of them. I'm going to read one from the very beginning, the first one, and then one from the very end because it's okay. nonfiction. So there's no spoilers. There's no, sure, you know, yeah. no, we know I'm not going to die at the end because here, <laughs> and, you know, it's it's just me. There's no there's no plot development really. Mm -hmm. So the first Great. one. In Cormac McCarthy's novel, The Road. While wandering a decimated earth in the aftermath of an unspecified holocaust, the nameless protagonist recalled standing in the charred ruins of a library where blackened books lay in pools of water. Shelves tipped over, some rage at the lies arranged in their thousands row on row. In our own just about pre-apocalyptic world, rather than be vandalized in fury at the false promise of meaning they embody, it seems likelier that libraries will gradually vanish from the surface of a connected and digital planet whereon they have come to seem anachronistic, no longer justifying the expense required to keep them open. I may be part of the last generation to whom the library was a place of formation, a resource and a sanctuary. When I was a child, my mother, who left school to work in her early teens, brought me and my brother to the local library having internalized a radio presenter's maxim that there is no better gift you can give your child than the gift of reading. As a teenager, I would return to the same library to borrow cassette albums, thus discovering the Smiths and Public Enemy, or order in books by Sylvia Plath and William Burroughs. A decade later, the libraries of Northeast London provided me not only with stacks of books, but, a work, but with a workspace. Living in a shared house near Finsbury Park, and when I say shared, I mean there were nine of us crammed into that semi-detached dump. It was not possible to write at home. The fact that one of my flatmates was an unemployed Bulgarian DJ who glared his skull-pounding trance from dawn till dusk was a factor. I wrote my first novel in Stamford Hill Library, cycling there daily with my laptop and a flask of coffee after I got home from work. Unemployed or homeless people likewise frequented the place, reading the newspapers or studying. I'm convinced that the blackness of that first novel of mine was in part a symptom of my Raskolnikovian peak at dwelling in that squalid house with those noisy vulgarians. But how much blacker it would have been had I no library to go to. If books themselves are destined to disappear as physical objects, raptured up into the digital imminence, then rather than do away with libraries altogether, perhaps we ought to leave them standing, denuded of books, but valued as sanctuaries of silence, honoring Nietzsche's contention 
that in a post-theistic epoch, churches should no longer hold a public architectural monopoly on reflection and solitude. Uh, and now, I'll, so yeah, all manner of uh, capers go down in the, in the interim, and then I'll skip all the way to the end. Um, the, the first one uh, came after a book, a, a column about a book by Svetlana Alexevich, The Unwomanly Face of War, a marvelous book. And the last one comes after a book by Henry Miller called The Colossus of Marusi. Mm. Beautiful, sunny kind of book. Henry Miller wrote a book titled The Books in My Life. I haven't read it, but that's a good title, an honest title. And that's what this book has been. Some of the books in my life and some of the life too, the life in my books. One day I might write another book composed not of memories and literature, but purely of colors, because right now that's what I'd like to convey, the colors, specifically the colors of the sea and the sky out here where I've walked each day while composing these dreams and reflections waiting for the planet to wake from its strange sleep. The drinkable blues, the lazuli and indigo and all those hues whose names I never knew, the turquoise sparkle on a calm sea, the frothing whites trailed by ferries bound for distant ports, the violet evenings, which are now the long evenings of incipient summer. I envy painters who are not obligated to narrate but need simply compose a mood from light and shade. The only colors I get to work with are white and black, if they even are colors. And so as compensation, I write about wandering and journeys, that being the closest I can get to the simple sensuousness of painting. I must be a frustrated painter because I'm writing this final page in plein air. Rather than finish the book while propped against a pile of pillows in bed, I've walked out along the cliffs to the headland at the curve of the coast and clambered down onto the beach. It's deep blue and golden, the finest day of a fine early May. I have the vista to myself. More accurately, I share it with the seabirds perched on the jawline of rock just offshore and the seals that bob in the waves near where I've laid my mat. I needed to leave the screens at home, my umbilical cord to a cabin feverish globe. Tusco Rock Lighthouse is out there on the horizon, a white erection, site of many sunken ships and an airline flight that went down and left no survivors. But let's not think about death and loss because this is a place where I feel at peace. A few years ago, I used to come out here while microdosing on LSD, spend hours wiggling my toes in the sand. A frivolous way to pass one's time on earth, no doubt, but I was happy enough. After I write these sentences, I'll lie down and close my eyes, the breeze on my skin, the surge of waves in my ear. I'll drift off and dream of lives on the other shore, friendly greetings, an exotic tongue, laughing children. I think I've dozed off already and I'm dreaming this page. I dedicate it to the seals who care little for a system in peril, an uncertain future. May they inherit the earth. Their skin is slippery and dappled with sunlight as they curl and dive in the surf like cosmic dancers. I think I'll join them soon, run with their crew, plumb the depths, it was fun to wear a human suit a while, play that funny role. Now it's time to bow out with grace. Let the fauna run things for an epoch. Check our privilege. Salutations, frolicking seals. I will meet you on the other shore. Rustler Harbor 2020. Okay, thanks so much, Rob. That was that was a lovely reflection to end the book on, actually. It just seems to be a very, very natural um finish to it i haven't read all of it yet but i'm looking forward to, to reading all those reflections so that was the first time i'd i'd heard that one as you said it's from the end yeah and um, i wanted to read that one because the winter is yeah. settling in so much and that's such a sunny you know colorful seaside piece it was like i, I thought the contrast might be nice 
Yeah, definitely. And, and it contrasted very nicely with the first one that you read, of course, about the libraries and, and books and, you know, libraries being like mausoleums. And yeah, it was, it was really nice as well. And thinking you may be the last generation to enjoy all the benefits that, that libraries give. It's a very sad thought. Hopefully it's not true. Um, we're, we're a bit old school here in this house, Rob. We still go to the library and check out DVDs. Yeah. <laughs> we do. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. Um, Claire Louise, I know you said uh, you, you underlined lots of stuff when you were reading through autobibliography as well. So I don't know if you want to maybe just come in with any comments for Rob on that. I do have it here. Um, well, I don't know. It's 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 just that nice nice uh, point where I've only had it a few days now, and it it, it just feels like a very kind of like um, a kind of a personal engagement, really. Um, mm. And I've underlined a the, uh, yeah the the piece about the the libraries resonated with me, and and then reaching a certain time in your life where you feel like you've, you've lived kind of enough and, and you're kind of reflecting. Um, I've done enough living uh, now and can now spend my time holding up the memories contemplation, determining what it all meant. Images flood in cities I've passed through, rooms where I've slept, friends who put me up or put up with me. In a couple of years, I'll turn 40. Schopenhauer wrote the first 40 years of the text. The rest is the commentary. I see that. And yet I feel that I'm somehow at the start of the life on the cusp, facing a future that's strange and turbulent, but not entirely hopeless. I mean, that really resonated with me. And it was kind of, um, sort of, it was sort of it expressed how I felt last year when I was writing Checkout 19, because I, I mean, I wrote it last year. Uh, during lockdown and uh, this passage that Rob has written is when during during lockdown and it's obviously given his life a certain quality um, that I that I identify with um, and I did feel a, a kind of a tremendous sort of freedom and lots of memories did come back to me last year because I suppose nothing in the present was was going on um, mm. so lots of things were were kind of coming back to me, um, and but and also I, I felt uh, a kind of a, a strange fr a freedom, really. Yeah. So, um, did, so did I, yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. in the early days of the lockdown, absolutely, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have to agree with that too, guys. It was, you know, I didn't have to suddenly spend a lot of my time commuting here, there, and everywhere. You know, it was you could just stay at home and, and do what you had to do, and yeah, it was there was it seemed to be a lot more time to write actually, which which mm. was great, you know. Um, so guys, there's a lot of questions actually in the Q and A. So um, let's have a look at those. Um, so we have the first one there from Liam Harrison. Uh, I read an autobibliography that Rob puts a packet of salt and vinegar crisps in every novel he's written so far. I know Rachel Kusk has said she always puts a dog in each novel she writes. Are there any recurring objects, crisps or otherwise, that Claire Louise likes to use in her books? And if there is, what role do these familiar objects play? <laughs> There's an interesting question. Well, apparently, and the, vinegar crisps between your pages, Claire Louise. Well, there are there are some crisps, but I think they're um like Monster Munch, right? Um, <laughs> and they're not in they're not they're not in ponds. There was no much a much underrated crisp. The monster. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is a, there is a passage um, about the indignity of just sharing a, a packet. It, it, they're fine if you have your own bag, but it, sharing them is just not nice for various reasons. Um, banana, a banana conditioner, body shop banana conditioner. Apparently, I didn't realize this, but um, it, it, I mean, I know it's there in Checkout 19, but apparently I refer to it in Pond as well, which I didn't, I didn't realize. And probably aubergines. aubergines. And I know the aubergine okay. emoji <laughs> yes, <laughs> is, is reference to something really rude. So, Feel kind of weird about that now. There's <laughs> 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 um, a sort of phallic connotation. That should but have yeah, been. I do, yeah, I do seem cover, to know all about the aubergine. The emoji on the front cover would have been splendid. I but. know, yeah. 
wearing kind of aubergine colored corduroys this evening as well. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what the, I don't know what, and that, I mean, I suppose that's the joyous thing in a way is that, um, and the interesting thing when, you, when you're writing is, um, you know, just to pay attention to, to kind of what, what you're writing rather than in intend a great deal. Because you do notice certain motifs kind of recurring. Mm. Um, and it's, you don't, you don't always know why. And it, it's sort of, it's okay not to know, to yeah. know why. But I think, yeah, I think, I think she goes some way then to sort of uncovering some of the appeal of the machine in the piece that I, I read that, you know, that their bulletproof skin and how they're sort of shiny but dull at the same time and kind of rubbery, but they're such strange things. Yes. <laughs> I'm obviously quite <laughs> taken with them. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure I've exhausted them yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's your answer, Liam. Yeah, yeah. Banana body shop shampoo with aubergines. <laughs> I didn't know that about Rachel Cusk and the dogs, actually. And that was something that struck me about my own new collection that came out when I was proofing it, that I have dogs in so many of my stories, actually. Um, but it didn't come as a surprise to me because, you know, I, I am a dog lover, I have to say. So they, they keep popping up in my stories. Um so uh, next question is from my good husband, David Butler. Uh, he says, a question for both. Uh, what would the ideal reader of your work be like? Um, Rob, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, I'd say he's roughly my height, kind of graying hair, parted to the side, sl skinny, slender kind of guy, comes from Dublin 12, Crumlin. Uh, you see where I'm going with this? Right? I do, I when do, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, I, I, I think, um, no, yeah, I, I, I think there's something to that, you know, there is, well, for me, anyway, um, essentially, I'm trying to write for the ideal reader who is myself, you know, because mm. I think we're all readers before we're writers, and, um, you know, the, the impulse to write comes from a lot of places maybe but one of the places seems to me to be from a desire to emulate to 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 you've gotten this incredible experience from reading from the discovery the shock of um coming upon another consciousness out there in the world that has the magic the ability the skill the craft the knowledge to be able to transmute that into prose or, or poetry or whatever it might be and put it out there as a book and so you kind of think you start to think I, I want to do that I want to I want to try that but you come to it as a reader then and yeah there's something in me is wanting my readers to have something like the same fanatical obsessive uh, the almost devotional relationship to to the books that I have had to the books in my life you know um the, not devotional that's too strong but you know what I'm getting at you know that sounds yeah. sounds like I'm forming a cult or something like that I'm not quite there yet but um something like something like that you know they, they, you're kind of writing for yourself to to put it's a it's a cliche but it's a, it's a useful one is the, the idea of putting into the world exactly the book that you want to see you know the book that you want to read and so the four i've written four of them so far and they all feel like very much oh yeah that was the little the little space that was there that i needed to fill you know yeah yeah i guess it, it ties in with what we were talking about earlier rob with being fascinated by certain topics and and wanting to write about them and write about the things that you're interested in and hoping that the reader is going to find them just as fascinating as you do so mm -hmm. that yeah makes absolute sense um and and so the same question then for you claire louise what would the ideal reader of your work be like do you have an ideal reader no, not really. I mean, just be contrary, I suppose. I could say, oh, someone who's mm. the complete opposite of me. I mean, that would be interesting, in a sense. Yeah. You know, that was somebody who had very different experiences and viewpoints and life circumstances, and yet they were able to kind of inhabit it in some way or take it on board in some way. And um, that's something I think that 
that Jack Up 19 does look at is the way that um, writing and reading kind of closes distances. Um, yeah, it's um, it's always a bit of a it's always a bit of a thrill to kind of feel that you've you've kind of maybe reached somebody that you didn't necessarily expect to, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a, that's definitely really interesting. Yeah, and, and and the same for a reader. I think reading about something that you know very little about, maybe, and but being able to find yourself engaging with it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So two very different answers, but but both just as logical. Um. Yeah. Terrific. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah. Um. Desmond Trainer then has a question about rejection. He said, are you surprised to be able to get by or to have got established as writers who are not writing with the aim of meeting mainstream market expectations? That's an interesting one. Yeah. Hmm. Should... What do you think, guys? Do you want to answer Louise first or should I? No, okay. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'll, I don't yeah. know how to address that. It is not. I don't know. I don't know how to address that. It's weird because he's talking about I don't know values and who is valued and what is valued and mm. and your you know your relationship to that and how you negotiate that and the ongoing precariousness of your life and it's just so thorny and it's it's there's so many facets to that and um, it's just not something mm -hmm. I feel I can address at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would just add that um, at risk of a kind of cop out, because it is an interesting and a, and a very fair question, but uh, there, there is an element of you wouldn't want to think about that too much or, to, or let it get too much in the way, you know, sitting again, it's that thing of sitting down to write an auto fictional novel or an experimental novel, but also the idea of sitting down to write something of commercial value. I just re I don't really think you're going to stay too connected to your own inspiration, which is, is a fragile enough thing, you know, if you go at it that way. But I do remember um, early on, one of the things, you see a lot of the books I, I love, even some of the ones I talk about in, in autobibliography are the kind of um, the little weird in between books, you know, not, not the, big, the, the big kind of canonical novels but maybe the, the odd book of letters or whatever that the, the author wrote in between those big books. And I remember thinking one of my ambitions, one of my main ambitions really was to get myself into a position where I would be able to publish the weird little books, you know, um, that, um, that I would be sufficiently respected, recognized, um, that I would be able to write something that was exactly what I wanted to write that didn't um, fulfill the, the prerequisites of, you know, the classical realistic novel or whatever, and still get it published. And happily, you know, touch wood so far anyway, it, it has played out that way. Like this book, if you, you know, the new one, if you, if you, it's a, it's an odd little book, you know, if you tried to explain that to a publisher before you wrote it, they would probably talk you down, you know? So I've always, like, one of my favorite writers is Jeff Dyer. And he kind of said to me once that, um, he's a real inspiration because his books are just so odd, you know, like what, where do they fit into any category? But he said once that, um, not worrying about whether or not a book is publishable almost guarantees that it will be publishable you know so when you sit down and you're going what is this crazy thing i'm writing like again i think of claire louise's prior book pond like yeah. if you tried to even summarize that or or, or pitch it mm -hmm. you know as a kind of elevator pitch before it was written it just wouldn't you couldn't because the, but um, if you write it with, without the fear, without the concern or without too much concern, you push the concern away about whether or not it's publishable, it probably will become publishable. It, assuming, of course, that you do it with sufficient wit and talent and all of that. That's, that's good advice, Rob. Yeah, and I'd agree that, you know, if you, if you 
overthought who you're writing for and whether it's marketable, I think it would take the good out of it altogether. I, I don't think you'd, you'd come up with anything remotely original if you were to think that way. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's looking at the publishers as well and hoping that, you know, somebody is going to come across the work and be just as passionate about it as you are. And I think a lot of the independent publishers are brilliant for that. You know, they're willing to take risks. Uh, which is fantastic. Uh, but an interesting question, Des. Thanks for sending that in. Um, Mairead Byrne asks, did you ever feel, any or all of you, that you're gradually working your way to poetry or have already arrived? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, I'm not sure if Mairead means literally poetry or poetic language or, you know, how we interpret that. It, it struck me, actually, Claire Louise, I was rereading um, some extracts from Pond earlier today, and some of the shorter ones are quite poetic, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you'd, you'd wonder, you know, could they possibly be prose poems? Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Do you want to take that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting question. Um, uh, yeah, I've, I've sometimes wondered if I'd had uh, maybe a different, like, I don't know, kind of education or a different kind of background, whether I would have maybe um, tried to write poetry or or recognised what I was writing as, as poetry. Um, but I I always kind of, I saw it as you know something else, something very um, just difficult, I suppose, and quite quite beyond uh, what I was capable of. Um, but certainly for for very very many years, the things I I was writing, um, they, they weren't um, weren't short stories. They were short pieces, but they weren't. I wouldn't really say now that I'm a short story writer at all. Um, and my relationship, I think, with language is maybe, I guess, similar to a, a poet's relationship um, mm -hmm. and the interest that I, that I, um, but then again, maybe not. I'm not sure, actually, thinking about that. I mean, I, I like the technicalities, really, of um, writing. Um, and I do get a bit cheesed off when I hear people kind of say that, you know, my work is kind of stream of consciousness and that kind of thing because it always makes me think well they just think I'm just sort of you know it all comes out kind of thing mm. talk about this you know it flowing and all the rest of it well you know it, there's a lot of dead ends in it and there's lots of reversals in it and lots of things that I'm very very conscious of when I work on a kind of sort of a what do you call it micro level really mm -hmm. but the architecture isn't you know these sort of big devices that we normally associate with, with narrative form but it's there in a much smaller way like the connective tissue is something that really really fascinates me so I'm, I'm working in a kind of a little motifs and echoes and riffs and um, whether that's aubergines or an emotion or a, something or small or, or hot and cold you know those qualities and I think um, I think it's just an attitude, isn't it, towards 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 language? And I think I was increasingly drawn then to sort of um, European writers. They don't necessarily make that those distinctions so much between poetry and short story and novel, you know. Yeah. Um, and I was very impressed by um, a, a set of essays by Italo Calvino, um, Six Memories of the Next Millennium, and he talks about you know qualities of language. Um, rather than looking at, you know, specific forms like the novel and short story. And that I felt very uh, sophisticated to me, much more sophisticated to me actually, as a way of kind of getting in to form and thinking about form and thinking what language can do and how it can kind of sit on the page and how things can be structured and come together and work. It's a kind of an organism. Um, so, so, yeah. It's the, it's, yeah, th those kinds of qualities, thinking about densities and lightness and multitude and vagueness and precision and all those kinds of things, like, they, they really, they really excite me. I'm working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's more about poetic language. Yeah. And, and Rob, how would you respond to that? I mean, where, where do you stand on, you know, poetry? Is it something that you, you steer clear of or you feel that, you know, there is some of that in your work already or... 
you well, know, are you working it, right towards it as the question says? No, it's an interesting question in that it makes me think on two things. On one hand, it's a, it's a firm no, because I absolutely mm -hmm. definitely work with prose, you know, prose is, is, is the, the, the linguistic style that I use. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, uh, because of all of these things that I've talked about from, from when we first started chatting here about trying to find greater and greater um, levels of freedom in what I write and um, kind of boundary dissolving forms of writing and, and, and structures and so on. Um, in that sense, I feel that I've always been kind of working or groping towards the formal possibility, the formal possibilities, the formal freedoms opened up to the poet where, you know, like I, in that thing I read about um, painters, you know, they, they, they don't have that obligation to narrate. They can just give you the pure mood, pure image, you know, the pure abstraction, whatever it is. And um, I've always been drawn towards writing like that, that doesn't, that just breaks free of the, um, the undergearding or whatever the phrase is of, of, of the novel, of the, of, of particular forms. And um, m much like Claire Louise said, I was drawn to European writers, particularly French ones for whatever reason, because they just seemed to be um, at the front of that um, refusal to care too much about distinctions between a novel and a memoir or the, the different genres and so on. So like I remember when I was writing um, This is the Ritual, there are a few stories in that one in particular, it's called Outposts. And I was so overjoyed when I wrote it. It's about, 30, it was first published in the magazine Gorse. It's about 30 pages long. And it's, it's just a series of kind of fragments, dreamlike fragments, um, which were a kind of collage of, of fictions, of quotations, of actual stuff that was happening to me, of stuff I just hear on the TV and put it in as a line of just stuff I would scribble down. And, but they, they, they didn't abide to any kind of obvious or overt narrative structure and format. And so they were the closest things I've ever written to poetry. Yeah. Um, but it was, again, it was the freedom of being able to write in, in, a, in a pure, unencumbered way like that. And still, crucially, hopefully, leading the reader through it. I'm, I'm one of those kind of slavish writers where I always do want to kind of keep the reader engaged. You know, I, I, I don't want to lose, I don't want to give up on the reader, but I want to have as much freedom as possible at the same time. Um, and so, um, yeah, but, but actually writing poetry in, in a more formal sense, it's not something I have any qualification to do at all. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And um, there's another question which which ties in with what something you both said there a moment ago. Um, Martin Giovanni says you both lived abroad. How useful was that in your success and how useful is being based in Ireland as part of your careers? Um, well, shall I answer? Yeah, go ahead, Rob. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in, in a success sense, I would say maybe not much. I, I, I don't know, you know, but uh, just in a, in a more broader creative sense, it's been really crucial for me. I've just been one of those people who almost from the word go, I was never even particularly interested in um, Irish literature. I always wanted to read what was going on in South America or in uh, Eastern Europe or in, in, you know, France or Italy or something like that, or in the States even. Uh, so wandering was always part of my desire and living abroad and just being immersed in strangeness in otherness in difference um, has been of near invaluable, well, in, in truly invaluable uh, richness experientially. And then that's really just being re being processed into so much writing that it's been crucial to me. And being based here in Ireland, I mean, I don't know, I'm not really, I try not to be, a, well, I don't even try, I'm just not really as connected with the maybe the literary world as I, as I, I, you know, I'll go to the occasional 
launch or something like that but generally uh, i'm not not so into that kind of thing these days so i don't know and these days everything is online anyway so i'm not so sure um that living here is uh as crucial as it once was for a kind of career sense it really was when i first started getting published i must say because i got my my first book was so aggressive and confrontational and kind of deviant that uh you know i kind of always had this image of publishers reading it in their offices and goes this guy's bad news you know so i I kind of felt i needed to meet these people to show them that hi you know i'm I'm just a normal bloke um and so in in, back around that time 2013 2014 i definitely was more i had just moved back to ireland and i definitely was more engaged with the the literary world and it was useful then frankly but it just you kind of uh you stop needing that so much i uh, maybe Okay, yeah, yeah, great. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. And Claire Louise, um, the, the same question then, how useful was it that you lived abroad? Um, and, and how useful is it being based in Ireland as, as part of your career? Does it make a difference? Um, well, yeah, I mean, um, as anyone who's, who's read Checkout 19 would know, um, I mean, it, it, it very much... Um, goes into that really the difficulty of um I was I was obviously born and grew up in in England um and come from, came from a working class background and um I grew up in a town where there was actual like it was the fastest growing town in Europe at the time it was abundant work and it was the sort of work that I wasn't interested in doing at all um so there was a lot of pressure on me to very quickly conform to a life um that I had no interest in in taking on um, and that was very uncomfortable and uh, difficult. So I, I escaped and I came to Ireland. Um, and that was quite some time ago now. And it, Ireland was quite a different place. It was a, particularly Galway was a really different place um, from, from, from what it is now. Like I said, I'm, I'm talking to you from a hotel room. I can't actually afford to live in Galway anymore. Um, <laughs> but uh, when I first came, it was very, very interesting. And it was far more cosmopolitan then than it is now, uh, bizarrely. Um, because there's just more people from very different parts of, of, of Europe here, lots of French, Spanish, whatever, because you could, you know, you can rent rooms quite easily and just a different scene. It was just a, a different buzz. Um, and, it, and it gave me the space that I didn't have and couldn't find in England um, as a working class woman. Um, so, yeah, it was huge. It was huge for me. It was, yeah, it was, um, mm. yeah, it was a huge thing. I was just kind of saying, like, lots of Irish people went over to England to find work and I came over to Ireland to get away from work. <laughs> 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 really cheeky. Sounds good, good to me, Claire Louise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So whether or not I would have been able to have, you know, would would I've become a writer if I'd stayed in England? I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of an interesting question. Mm. Kind of not an interesting question. I'm not sure. But yeah, yeah. Not you not know. Well, on too long. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, we'll finish up, guys, on a question uh, there from Mike McCormick, who says, "Great discussion. Well done, Rob and Claire." Um, would the writers care to comment on the recent welcome resurgence, resurgence of experimental writing in Ireland? The experimental impulse lay dormant for so long, but has had a welcome renewal of late. Do the writers have any idea as to why this has come about? So this resurgence in Ireland of experimental form. Um, well, I don't know. I'm not I'm not I don't know maybe I'm more conscious of it in 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 a UK context just simply because of things like uh Goldsmith's prize and different things that where where it's brought to light a bit more and there's a bit more I don't know but I'm not sure there's a a resurgence of the impulse I think the impulse has probably always been there it's just that more of it's been published um and you know as as previously said you know it it tends to be written by and, and historically has been written by people who just are living sort of quite different lives alternative lives from what we see depicted in sort of conventional novels so increasingly we are seeing books published by people from uh, working class backgrounds or different racial backgrounds or gendered backgrounds and that's probably why you know and it's and it's quite natural to um for anyone you know coming coming from I suppose the margins or um a different perspective to to write in in an experimental way it, it doesn't feel experimental to us <laughs> Yeah. Really, you know. Yeah. Um, so I, I would imagine that, that that because more of those voices are, are sort of are being published now, being recognised, and 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 there's a, 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 an effort um, 
you know, a, a kind of concerted uh, systemic effort, particularly in the UK, um, to, to get those voices out there. I think, I think mm -hmm. that's, that's I'm, not, I'm, I'm not quite sure um, wh why that might be the case, case here, maybe something sort of similar, but I, I guess yeah. it's a different set of conditions, but. Sure, yeah, yeah. Maybe Rob has. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah. I, would, I would agree with all of that. I think that was well said. And then I would only really add that maybe, and it's quite an obvious thing to point out, but just the fact that the world has been blown wide open you know, in the last, I don't know, 30 years, but especially in the last, say, 10 years by, by, by the, the, the proximity of everything through technology, through the internet, through social media, through our phones and so on, that um, parochialism just doesn't really come in, or even parochialism, or even just the kind of narrow national literatures, you know, don't really have the same... Um, sway as they used to for better or worse because you know your your, your typical reader now i imagine is going to be reading books from all over the place you know because mm -hmm. they're going to be I don't, how, how does someone who's 20 now even find out you know what what to read is it, is it through tiktok is it through instagram i don't even know you know but i have a feeling that they're not just going to be reading in the narrow national traditions of which they're from and so uh they, they'll be just exposed to more it's like you know you listen to music now and the very idea of genre um has kind of crumbled or dissolved to some degree to me that's hugely exciting i just love hearing these new kind of artists um who are just mixing it all up together it's just because that's how it is now you know that's how we, we live and how we consume art and music and so on and i wonder if that's going on in literature, in writing to some extent as well. Um, but certainly I do feel that, as Mike says, this uh, impulse has been awakened, if it ever was asleep. But I, I do feel now there's a nice sense that if I go into a bookshop and look at, say, the latest batch of writers you know particularly let's say new writers and novels be they irish or english i'm not quite sure what's gonna be there when i open up the page you know structurally formally there will be all manner of uh inventions and novelties going on and and i think what what i hadn't thought of it before but what claire louise said resonates with me is that you know it doesn't feel experimental to us these are just people who don't really fit into that conventional narrative like the classical english novel i suppose it was written by the middle the middle classes the hampstead types the bloomsbury types or whatever and um this is not really so much the case anymore uh, yeah yeah, so that, that was their reality. Um, yeah, it, it, so just, just a comment there to finish up. Tony Hines says, um, experimental is just honesty to a writer like Rob and Claire Louise, um, I feel, and that's what I want from the books I read. And Rob Doyle and Claire Louise Bennett are two of my favourites, and he, he thanks you for the discussion this evening. So I think that's, that's a really good note to end on. So guys, I'd just like to say... Um, you know, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you both this evening and hearing all of your thoughts and, and hearing you read from your new books. And I want to wish you the very best to look with them. Um, so, so thanks so much for joining me here tonight. Um, as Dan mentioned at the beginning of the event, this is the first of three events. I'll be on the other side of the table, as it were, for the second event, um, which will be hosted by Mike McCormick. And it's an event on the short story and he'll be interviewing myself, David Butler and Rosemary Jenkinson about our new short story collections that have just come out with Ireland House. Um, so I hope you'll join us for that one, guys. That's on December the 1st. Um, I'd just like to thank my colleagues in NUIG and the Moore Institute for sponsoring this event and, of course, the Arts Council of Ireland. So thank you so much, guys. And thanks to everybody who joined us here this evening. See you soon. Thanks.